Do you have a rich brain? And if you don't, you might not have a rich wallet either. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Today, we're going to talk about the mindset that's required in order to be successful in any business, including real estate. And if you don't have this rich brain or particular mindset, you may find yourself sabotaging your efforts every single time. Our guest today is Bronson Hill, managing member of Bronson Equity. He's a general partner in 2,000 multifamily units worth over $200 million. He's also the host of Mailbox Money, where he breaks down the investor mindset and has personally raised over $42 million for real estate. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. Bronson, welcome. Kathy, excited to be here. It's always great talking with you. I always learn something and love love the positive energy. You always bring the positive energy and the smile and just love it. So, Oh, thank you so much. Well, today we're going to get real po- positive because we're going to be talking about your new book, Rich Brain. Love the title. All right. Tell me, what do you mean by a rich brain? Yeah. So the subtitle, this is my second book. My first book is called Fire Yourself Behind Me. This uh, rich brain uh, was really inspired. I had a conversation uh, in an Uber, um, and I was talking about, you know, an investor was going to send some money and it was, you know, a conversation that's probably not a normal Uber conversation. Somebody's wiring a hundred thousand dollars or something kind of like that. And so as I got off the, the phone, this driver who was a young lady in probably early thirties, um, she said, Hey, how do I, how do I, I heard you overheard your conversation. How do I learn about money? How do I learn to become wealthy? And I thought about it there. I really, you know, some books I could recommend and different things, but there was really nothing that taught, um, kind of what it really takes to be wealthy, because being wealthy is not having money or not having money. Uh, most people actually, their plan to become wealthy is either to A, win the lottery, or B, to have the, you know their rich uncle passes away and they get all this money. So they want to have the stuff, but they don't want to actually become a wealthy person. And so uh, this basically comes from over 2,500 individual interviews I've had with uh, millionaires on really what are the wealth habits, how the wealthy change their brain to change their bank accounts. So there's some specific things around mindset and also specific habits that if you change your mindset in these certain ways, like Tony Robbins says, uh, success in life is 80% psychology. And if you do these certain actions, you will become wealthy. Oh, I love this so much. <laughs> I went through this transformation myself, um, you know, over over 25 years ago, when, as you know, my story, Rich had melanoma, the doctor told him he had six months to live, I was freaking out, I was a stay at home mom with two young kids in a new house, too many expenses. We didn't have savings, not enough, that's for sure. And that started my journey of understanding the mindset of wealthy people. Like, how do we get out of this rut? How do we get out of this, you know, never having enough at the end of the month, even though we're making more money every year? Why? You know, what is going on? What don't we know? And same thing, I just started interviewing wealthy people on my show and I noticed my brain shifting. I noticed that wealthy people think differently than normal people. So what are some of, what are some of the differences? Yeah. So the biggest, the first thing I'll just touch on is, is the mindset. Um, often I think we, uh, it's been said that 95% of, of, you know, of, of people have what are called self-sabotaging behaviors. So we do things like we, we have negative self-talk, we procrastinate, we have perfectionism. We do things that actually prevent us from actually taking steps and actually moving. And part of this is as well, uh, for an example, let's say if I go into a situation that I've had negative self-talk. So let's say I'm a single guy and I go and I I approach a beautiful woman. Um, If I approach her in the sense that like, oh, she's going to say no, or why would she talk to me? Or I'm not worth, if I don't feel worthy of a great relationship with a beautiful woman, then how's that conversation going to go? Probably not very well. And we wouldn't think of that. We think of that in that situation, it's very easy to understand, but in terms of money, it's actually very similar because what will happen is if we don't feel like we're worthy of having wealth, then we don't really ex- expect for wealth to be there. We don't make decisions in a way that kind of we're planned out that, hey, this is something that's going to be uh, take place in our life. So people that I interviewed that are wealthy, they either already had this. Maybe they came from a place where they had this worthiness that they felt like they deserved it. Uh, Brandy Brown kind of talks about this as well. She says the difference between people who uh, achieve or have you know great relationships in their life is they felt worthy of those things. 
So, and that those that don't, you know, just didn't, they just didn't feel worthy of it. So there's a, there's a whole piece around worthiness that, um, I used affirmations. I have this thing that I created called whisperings and just the things that we say to ourselves and how we really change the self-talk that we've had. Cause again, if we're playing the tape of what we have when we were a kid, often it's never very negative. Uh, I'm not, you know, no one likes me. I'm ugly. I'm whatever these things are. We have to change those tapes. And so once we start to change that, and going back to Tony Robbins, 80% of success in life is psychology. We have to come and approach approach things from a place of the right mindset that says we're worthy of actually having good things in our life. And so often this is the piece that's missed in our new book, Scaling Smart. The entire first chapter is about this, the mindset. And people often want to skip over it, but it is the most important section, which is why we put it in chapter one, because sometimes that's as far as people get in books. (laughs) A lot of times, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, for me, I had to actually hypnotize myself. I listened to a, a a meditation on wealth. And in that meditation, you had to go into a really deep, calm place and imagine yourself wealthy and then notice all the gremlins, all the negative Mm -hmm. thoughts that would come up around that. And for me, it was like, well, people won't like me anymore if I'm wealthy because I'll be different. Or they'll like me only because I'm wealthy and I won't know who my true friends are. Or they'll try to steal it from me and I'll be a target. It was all the things that all of these thoughts that came up, um, which clearly prevented me from ever wanting to be that person, right? Yeah. And to, so the first step is really noticing, noticing those negative thoughts. How, how do you do that? How do you identify what's holding you back? Yeah. And this is the amazing thing. I'll just take a step back for a second. Um, a one belief system around, and you kind of brought it up too, is that, you know, how we think about people that are wealthy, there's this class warfare that's out there. That's like, oh, there's the haves and the have nots. Right. And so, um, one thing that I discovered in my research, there's a study that came out by Fidelity Investments that found that 86% of millionaires are self-made. So again, the whole silver spoon, it's just not true. It's, it's, it's almost nine out of 10 people that are millionaires actually figured it out themselves. These are learnable things that we can do. And so, you know, once you get the mindset, you're still going to get the, the mindset kind of work in the right direction. And you start saying, oh, I'm worthy. And what happens, at least what happened for me, is that once I started saying or, or you know, speaking these whisperings or saying these things in the mirror, I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of, I, I own the room like a, like a king or, you know, I, I, get, I just these things that sound a little silly to say out, out loud here. But as I would say them over time, it didn't feel uh, you know, necessarily always authentic in the beginning, but over time it started to create this in my life. So it didn't happen right away a month, two months, three months, but I say six to 12 months later, I started to, uh, and for me, this really came from a place where I went through a personal crisis. I went through a divorce uh, eight years ago. And so I just felt like no personal confidence coming you know, out. I was like, well, who am I and what am I doing? And so I started saying these things around confidence and ability and worthiness. And then six to 12 months later, I felt it kind of emanating from the inside. So there's this thing that sometimes we know something to be true. Like we know we're loved by people around us. We know our family cares about us. If you're a person of faith, you you know God loves you, whatever. But if you don't feel it in your heart, it's just information that's up here. It hasn't transferred there. And similar to what you did, it's, it's, it's a meditative practice to continue to say these things that you know to be true, but then you have to get them where they come, they start, they flow out of your heart. Because if you show up in a room and you know you're worthy of being there, you're gonna show up very different than if you're, oh, I'm really not sure or whatever. It has to come from the inside. And so there's this huge connection between personal development and wealth. And I love your story, Kathy, how you said, yeah, I got this and I started meditating. And I did, uh, you know, I hypnotized myself and I got in this place, this meditative space. And it really allowed me to be in a place where I could, I could create from that. And I could be like, oh, this is actually who I am. So I think that's like the first and most important thing. And then there are some specific habits that people that are wealthy do that are, are different than other people. Yeah, the subconscious is like, it's so much more powerful than our conscious mind. So the more we can be conscious of our subconscious and those thoughts that are controlling us, the quicker we can, um, you know, bring that into our conscious mind. It's it's powerful stuff. All right. So what are some of the habits of wealthy, of the wealthy mind? Yeah. So um, one really that I noticed to be very different from, um, from a lot of other people is that, you know, this is the average American will read, um, you know, less than 12 books a year. Uh, half of Americans read four books or less versus the average CEO will read 50 to 60 books a year. Um, so I realized, you know, you look at Warren Buffett, you look at Mark Cuban, Oprah Winfrey, a lot of really wealthy people, and they tend to be readers, but even more than readers, they tend to be learners. They really commit to their own education, whether it's workshops, it's going to events, it's trying to just understand how something works. 
And, um, you know, how I had a lot of these calls with investors, they were, you know, these high net worth people, they were investors that were interested in learning about our deals. They were taking 20, 30 minutes to like learn about what we do as we were interviewing them, they were interviewing us. And so again, these are people that are very busy people like Warren Buffett, one of the wealthiest people in the world. He reads hours a day, right? So if, if he, you know, we say, oh, I don't have time to read, I don't have time to read. Well, you don't have time not to read, right? There's this, <laughs> there's such a focus on reading that it's, it's like, it's treated like a part-time job. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who, you know, a American president, he would read a book or two at night. He would finish dinner, you know, about eight or nine o'clock and he just, he'd read a book or two every single night. And so the idea of really committing to learning as a job or as a vocation, um, it doesn't pay you right away, but it's, you start to make connections between things you would not have connected. And, and especially historical books, self-help. It can even be novels, it can be different things, but reading is is really incredible and, and, and readers really become leaders. It's like the miracle morning. You could just just read, a I don't know, 10 minutes every morning uh, would make a difference. My, my husband, Rich, doesn't love to actually read, but he loves eBooks. And if yeah. you think about the amount of time you spend in your car, even just going to the store or going to the airport or whatever, you can read a whole lot of books. It's, it's funny. You said 50 to 60. He does, um, which is far more than me because he just listens to the eBooks. So yeah. we're lucky. We're lucky. Yeah, that, that I, we I do. Uh, yeah. Audiobooks. Yeah. You mentioned audiobooks. So yeah, I, I did last year. My goal was, um, was audiobooks is what I meant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not eBooks. Yeah, I, I finished, <laughs> I had 98 books last year. So it's something that I, I think audiobooks count. So I'm very auditory as like, oh, that doesn't count. You didn't actually read the book. I was like, well, no, I actually retain pretty well when I listen. So, uh, you know, when I'm on a run, when I'm uh, driving, when I'm walking, doing things around the house, I was just actually earlier listening to a book by Charlie Munger, which is uh, uh, poor Charlie's, Charlie's Almanac, because they wrote a book he wrote about investing in life. And, and it just, there's so many things that it brings together. So I think that, uh, again, really looking at it like this is something that's going to teach me a way to become wealthy. And uh, it's been said by a number of people, you have to, if you want to earn more, you have to learn more. And so books are a great way to do it. There's obviously other ways to do it, but just this focus on continually growing and learning. And I think that's what keeps people young as people, keep people sharp as they get to be older. Uh, most people kind of stop learning. You know, most people get kind of in their thirties, forties, they stop reading books. They stop kind of engaging with life. They watch hours and hours of TV a day. And it's just not good for us, not good for our brains. And it's also not good for our wealth. Yes. And you have got to be so disciplined. It's so easy to plop on the couch when you're tired and just watch TV. But uh, yeah, no. I, I agree. Learning is so important. And so many people started their big career, the, the turning point career in their 40s, in their 50s. You know, so don't don't give up in your 30s. You still have a whole life ahead of you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that's the thing you see people that, you know, will commit to, to learning and reading. It's, it's, it's really the growth mindset that you have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. There's that book by Carol Dweck called mindset. And it just says that, you know, when something bad happens, um, uh, you know, it, it says that, you know, I'm a failure. If this thing failed, I'm a failure. And I have a friend actually, I did some, uh, before I got into larger deals, I was doing some single family in Cleveland and did pretty well there, did some smaller single family stuff. And then I had a friend kind of follow and did, did kind of did things a little different and just totally, you know, got destroyed in Cleveland. And he, you know, he just never really invested after that. It was really sad. He took it very personal and isolated. And, but again, it's, it's the growth mindset will say everything is information. You know, when I lost $70,000 in one day through an options trading strategy, when that was about a third of my net worth years ago, um, that was a very painful day. But I determined that I was going to learn everything I could from that. And one of the biggest lessons is I'm not a good options trader, right? I should be doing other types of deals. And so that was okay. <laughs> but um, I think in life, everything is information. Everything is learning. And if we can just continually have a growth mindset, it will really help us to, to grow our wealth as well. I love that so much because most people who have created great wealth have also lost money. And, and if you look at money as fluid, it comes and it goes. If you've lost it, if you've had it and lost it, you will be able to find it again. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's if you've never had it, then it, it could be harder because you don't have that mindset, but yeah, never give up. All right. What other, what other kinds of habits do wealthy minds yeah. or do rich minds have? Yeah. So, uh, the one was learning. The second one I really focused on in the book, uh, was really the idea of, you know, your network, uh, really is, is your net worth mm. idea of net worthing. Um, and so what the idea, you know, really is net worth. It, net worth <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if let's say I want to lose, uh, some weight, I want to, uh, improve my spiritual life, whatever I get around, I get around people that are really like are, are better in those areas than I am. 
And so if I want to improve my wealth, I've got to get around people that are wealthier than I am. So if somebody listening just thinks about who are the five people I actually spend the most time with, well, it's probably your family, maybe some coworkers, maybe a, a best friend or two. Um, and, and just think about, well, you know, if I average those people up, I'd probably find that's probably what your net worth is. You know, that's probably what your health habits are. That's probably what, you know, the way you live your life. So if I want to grow my wealth, I've got to get in rooms where I'm in rooms where people have a 10x net worth than I do or 100x, or they're doing things in business that I really admire. And what will happen is as I do that, um, it, it will just it will just naturally pull me up. Because um, it, I'll give an example of this. When I was um, getting ready to leave my job, I had this great job. I was making 250K a year doing medical device sales. It was the golden handcuffs. I couldn't leave. I wanted to I, I wanted to have control of my time. Everybody says they want financial freedom. I just wanted time freedom. I wanted to be able to like travel and, you know, I travel six times a year internationally. I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. And I just, you know, I I really enjoy that. So I think that for me, um, you know, just really being able to, to, um, you know, find a way to, to, to get outside of it. So I talked to my friends and family and they were all like, well, no, why would you leave your great job? Don't do it. That's a terrible decision. And then I got an entrepreneurs group and without exception, these other six guys we met together with every month, they said, oh yeah, you should pretty much leave your job as soon as possible. And if it doesn't work, you could always go back to medical sales. And so like, it was exactly what I needed to hear, but I needed that support. And so I think who you surround yourself with really determines where you're going. 100%. Uh, I know I am where I am because of the network, the network that I created over the years. And and that network will change as you grow. Um, not that you're not friends or colleagues with the people who helped you get started, but maybe, maybe again, their income was just above yours or their knowledge was just past yours. But at some point you might, you might outgrow them and your network grows as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it is, it's really true. And the people that are wealthy, they're always, uh, I think even Robert Kiyosaki who wrote the book, rich dad, poor dad said that, you know, people that are middle-class are always looking for, for better jobs or better pay, but people that are really wealthy are always looking to grow their network because that's how you get access to great deals. That's how you learn about new opportunities. That's how you learn about new trends and things that are happening or even business opportunities. And I give an example, uh, in the book where, um, I, was that, I, you know, I was doing my medical sales. I had raised you know, my, our businesses. We raised capital and we, we do you know, raise about 45 million now, but the first hundred thousand from an investor, I, I met at a meetup. And then I, I, I met a partner at this event that was a, it was a cruise. It was an investor cruise. And I know, I think you've been at this event as well. Yeah. So I approached this person and I said, Hey, how's it going in this specific area of your business? And is this something I can help with? And because of that, um, it really led to this huge thing. And together we raised uh, $15 million together over the next uh, 18 months. And that dramatically increased my net worth, my value, what I was able to do. And that whole thing really came from, first of all, being at the event. And then secondly, being at a round table, one person off the cuff just kind of said, hey, you know, it's like that quote from Jim Rohn, make yourself valuable to valuable people. And I'd never heard that before, but I was thinking, make yourself valuable to valuable people. I was like, huh, well, I've gotten value from this person and how can I make myself valuable? And I think that people that have become wealthy often have found ways to create value for people that are doing things of high value. And so that's something I've found in my life. If you can just find a way to partner, find a way to bring value to people, that's how people get paid really well. Oh my gosh, that is so so it the key to wealth is providing value. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to hate on the on the wealthy. They they have a track record of bringing value to others or else they totally. wouldn't have that money. Except maybe if it was just given to them. But if it was just given to them then they there's a good chance they might just lose it. You know, truly um, building and growing your wealth comes down to that. Yeah, hundred percent. That's why, you know, Jeff Bezos, okay. He's a billionaire. People don't like that. Oh, he's got all this money and he can afford it. Well, you know, I, I love that I can order stuff and Amazon delivers it the next day. Sometimes the same day. Yeah. And like, I, it's so much, I save so much time and it's so convenient. Right. So I'm yeah. happy that, you know, I'm paying him to do, you know, as long as I get value, I'm happy with it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why I think we should really celebrate people that, that create value and not penalize them or demonize them. And actually yeah. when we demonize people that are wealthy, we're actually subconsciously uh, preventing ourselves become, from becoming wealthy also. Oh my gosh. Whenever I see comments, uh, you know, after shows or, you know, on a YouTube channel and it is hateful, I just feel so sad instead of taking it personally. It's like, oh, they're stuck in this place where they can't they can't grow wealth with that mindset. Mm -hmm. If you hate on those who have wealth, why on earth would you want that? Why would you want to be wealthy instead of looking at how have they created value and how can I provide value? Maybe, like you said, maybe even for them. Yeah. 
hundred percent. No, it, it's so true. It's just these things that we don't realize that we're, uh, we're actually, it, it's just so easy to be a critic. I think our, our mind is generally programmed pretty negative to, for survival. Mm -hmm. And that's where the reprogramming just through, you know, the wealthy change their brains to change their makeup. They, they change by doing, you know, having different beliefs and taking different actions. And, you know, if you're wealthy, you can have an abundance mindset where there's more than enough for everybody. And we do a deal together. The pie gets bigger. It's not like there's only so much. We actually can change our beliefs. And it's so empowering to live from that place of abundance. Love it. All right. We have time for one last tip. All right. Well, um, shave your head and your life will be amazing. Oh, perfect. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, as far as wealth, I mean, I think um, just to double down on some of the things I've shared is that, you know, I was able to 20X my net worth through doing these two things, right? And so these are things that they confirm in the interviews that I did, but just seeing through the idea of of education and networking, right? Learning the never ending learning as a, as a job or as a, as a, as a vocation of, Hey, this is something that's that important to me and it will pay me maybe not today, tomorrow, but it will over time. Um, you know, these, and then the other one is, is really the networking piece, but uh, there's a great book by Jeff Olson called the slight edge. And this talks about, there's a chart in there, but it shows like, you know, if I make a bad choice for myself, let's say I start smoking, I don't smoke, but let's say I started smoking. Well, it wouldn't kill me today or tomorrow or in five years, but in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, that would start to have a dramatically exponential negative effect in my life. But if I read at your example, 10 minutes a day, uh, over time, that would have a dramatic positive effect over time. So just think everything we do is a choice. It's not, we should obsess over these little things, but in a way it's like, well, if we do something consistently over time, I've just started taking walks in the morning for 25 minutes and it's a great way to wake up and get focused. And I love that. And I get more steps in. And so I think it's just really considering the habits that we have, the things that we intentionally create, really we make our habits and then our habits make us. Love it. Bronson Hill, thank you so much. You can get his book, Rich Brain, uh, where? Well, Rich Brain is not out yet. So I'm giving okay. it like a kind of a pre uh, release Sweet. on it. I do have Fire Yourself, which is replace your working income with passive income in three years or less. That's available on Amazon. I also have a free gift for uh, your audience. I have, I've written some stuff on uh, inflation. Obviously, we talk a bit about inflation. Inflation is officially you know, three, three and a half percent. We think, I think it potentially could be much higher. So there's a way you actually can use it to your advantage instead of being uh, penalized by it. And so I have a free ebook called how to use inflation to your advantage, some really creative strategies. Um, you can text the word inflation to three, three, seven, seven, seven. Um, and so it's three, three, seven, 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 the word inflation, and we'll send that over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on the real Wealth show. We Thanks look so much, forward Kathy. to having you back. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to continue reading and expanding your mindset, go check out our new book, Scaling Smart, How to Design a Self-Managing Business so that you can have more freedom to live life on your own terms. And that business can be real estate or anything else where you are creating value for others. Again, check it out, Scaling Smart. We are number one in new releases. Very excited about that. So we appreciate your support and especially your reviews on Amazon. We read them all and really appreciate it. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.